These were teaching trips and uh, two asterisks. These were our uh, anniversary trips where we, the 34 days across America was an anniversary trip. Myanmar for 32 days was a teaching trip. Um, Providence, uh, the Maritime Provinces in Canada was an anniversary. We went to Kenya for 30 days. Scotland for 30 days was an anniversary trip. 21 days in Indonesia, Kenya, England, all teaching trips. Uh, three times for 18 days each in Thailand, uh, 13 days in Ecuador, 12 days in the Apache Indian Reservation in Arizona, and seven days each for disaster relief trips to Puerto Rico and St. Croix. And we had a layover in Iceland for three days. And that was, uh, that was just a blessing to be able to do that for three days. I want to go back. It's a, if you've not been, it's, a, it's an otherworldly place. So I want to start with uh, Africa, Kenya, Mathari Valley. In this first image, to give you an idea, the Mathari Valley is two miles long and three quarters of a mile wide. And it's home to nearly a million people in poverty. Now, some of you have been to other places, I'm sure, that, uh, that represent this kind of density of poverty. Um, and you know what I'm talking about and what it looks like. Uh, I'm taking this photograph uh, from the top of a uh, educational building. And I want you to notice this little girl right down here in the bottom. She's dressed in her little uniform, getting ready to go to school. Um, the Kenya government does not have an educational facility for the Math uh, Mathari Valley. And so two individuals, um, the, the, uh, oh, when you get to be 77 years old, you have little, these little brain things that happen to you. Um, Mary Kamau and Wallace Kamau started out with 50 children uh, in Mathari Valley and decided to start a school with them uh, and educate them. Well, for a, for a million people, that's a drop in the bucket. Today, they have over 14,000 kids in schools. Um, so that's just a kind of giving you a, a background of Missions of Hope International and this is the poverty. And if you just look at this one little place right here, uh, this is typically a unit. And all of these units are gathered together. And a unit that may be about uh, 8 by 10, 10 by 10, 10 by 12, uh, will house anywhere up to uh, uh, 6 to 8 people, 10 people. Uh, it's, it's incredible. So this image is like uh, this little boy over here on the left was coming out and he was standing there looking at this tall white guy uh, saying, you know, who you are. Um, and I got a, got a sh shot of him. And this little girl over here on the right, uh, sitting in front of her house, uh, happy. Uh, these kids, even though they're poverty stricken, they are happy kids. They are, it's when they begin to understand the world around them and uh, the world uh, that they're not part of, that they become sad or, or, or lonely. The first trip I met, went over there was with a group uh, from Mountain Christian Church. And it was, we had 90 people. Uh, the 90 people, just to give you an idea, uh, we had doctors, we had nurses, we had carpenters, we had uh, teachers, we had uh, nurses, we had people who were knitters, painters, we had all kinds of professions. And like uh, uh, my wife and I are licensed clinical marriage and family therapists. And our job was simply in that 90 group of people was simply to uh, teach the teachers to teach the leaders uh, about family systems therapy, about understanding what family systems are all about and how it could help them in organizing and structuring 
uh, part of their responsibilities in Mathari Valley. Um, unfortunately, you know, you, you look at this image, um, there are a lot of people who are addicted. This guy is not drunk. The, what he has in these bottles uh, are uh, the airplane glue that's been uh, banned in the United States and most cultural uh, uh, first world countries. Uh, for years. And he's just collected bottles and put glue in it, and he is laying outside of the school. Now, the photographic part of this is I'm actually on the third floor of a school building looking down at the pathway across from the school, and I'm using a Coolpix uh, P900 Super Zoom that goes from 24 to 2000. And I know it's not the best camera in the world. It's not, I, I shoot with Nikon, I have a 750, and now I just I have an 850, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But it's like, here was a, a super zoom shot taken from three stories up of this guy laying on the side of the ground. Um, and it's a JPEG image, a large JPEG image, and it's not a, uh, a raw image. Now, Nikon has come out with the P1000, and it does have the capability of raw. Again, it's not the best camera in the world. Um, it, uh, it's, it's a little under $1,000. It's just a zoom lens. It's a point and shoot. Uh, but you can see that you get a lot of clarity. Uh, that I was quite frankly surprised by. I usually take it as a backup camera when I want to take a shot that um, I don't want somebody to see I'm taking those shots. So um, the colors are just are fantastic uh, for me. Um, the other thing is I do all my post-processing uh, in Lightroom. Uh, I'd say 99% of post-processing is Lightroom. The other 1% is in Photoshop or other programs that I, that I have. So walking along Mathari Valley, and there's just, uh, you know, miles, to, it sounds like ridiculous to say you're in three quarters of a mile and two miles uh, long, but uh, all these little avenues or little funnels, pathways that you can go through. You can walk miles and miles and miles within that, that little distance. I saw this as we were walking along. This was a, a group of about three of us um, who had uh, one of the, the native uh, residents of the of Mathari Valley with us. And I just thought it was a story shot. Uh, this little kid sitting on the ground is like, probably lives back in here someplace. And unfortunately, and I'm not trying to demean anybody when I say this, but one of the things that happens uh, in Mathari Valley is a lot of prostitution, a lot of uh, thievery, a lot of other things that are going on. But uh, this little girl's probably sitting out on the side of the road simply because mom is back in here servicing probably, and we were told this by, uh, by the guide that was with us. And just to capture this woman with her child strapped on her back and this sort of abandoned child um, is part of the, the, the beauty of being able to go on some foreign mission trip uh, to do work in a whole different field um, and be able to do the photography that you, that you want to do. This would be a street photography shot. Uh, you know, that you may not get away with in the United States. This one um, I composed for the window and what was going on outside. And again, this was with the P900. Uh, wasn't with my Ni the, the Nikon 750. Um, because I, I wanted to be able to just capture the uh, the sense of this is a classroom inside a classroom. Uh, there's probably two light bulbs in the the room, but this 
outside life. This is this is what the kids live in. This is what the families live in. These little partition huts. These are stores uh, that are out here. You may see the word hotel, um, and hotel really means restaurant. Uh, it's not a place to sleep. It's a place to eat. And I I don't know if you can see this hand being raised. Just about the time I took the shot kid raised his hand and hit, had it in a fist and, I, and it was uh, it was just interesting uh, and I was able to pull out the detail the reflections of light that they had uh, on their faces in in Lightroom um, and again this was taken on our second trip and on our second trip to uh, Mathari Valley to Kenya it was just my wife and I uh, that's the time we were there for 30 days. Uh, again, teaching teachers, social workers, leaders, anybody uh, that they wanted us to help uh, understand systemic therapy for uh, families. I, I thought this was a novelty shot for me. Again, if, if you've ever been in third world countries where you see this greenish, bluish, uh, material on the ground, uh, you know that you're around a failed sewer or a failed uh, system. And I thought the, the incongruity of the prestige salon hairstyles or hair designers, and I think she was looking at me like, why are you taking this picture? Uh, which is probably pretty honest. Um, but this, this just gives you an image of uh, what it's like in, in a, a third world country that has extreme poverty. Um, and again, many of you have maybe taken trips like this um, and you've seen other parts of the world that have this kind of um, uh, extreme poverty. But there, for, for me, again, the teaching was the most important thing, but the photography, was the benefit of being able to go on a trip like this, uh, or all the trips that I've ever gone on. It's, it's, they're, they're wonderful. Very rarely do you actually have outhouses in Mathari Valley. And I turned this one into a black and white because I enjoyed the, uh, the contrast in it. But it's, uh, it was donated by the International Women's Club in the city of Nairobi which is uh, just about five miles outside of Mathari Valley. Um, and it's, you can see it's pretty well run down and not maintained very well. Uh, they donated it, but uh, as you saw in the last shot, uh, you know, that probably is just running all over the place. It's not, uh, it's not something that's taken care of. Now, this, shows you the juxtaposition of, of uh, the dump, uh, the, the place where people just throw stuff. And these two brightly painted buildings are actually buildings that are part of the school. And because of uh, foreshortening, you're not actually, the, the dump is not actually up on the school. There is a road in between uh, that you're not seeing. And, and it's like, I think I took this with the, the, uh, the 70 to 200 uh, because I wanted to, to shorten this up to, to give a compactness of it. Uh, on the other side of Mathari Valley, there are, there are nice uh, apartments being built or uh, apartments being built. I won't say they're nice, but they're nicer than what people are living in the valley. People in the valley are right back down in here. Uh, in this narrow three quarter of a mile strip. Um, but it gives you an idea of what is happening with uh, Missions of Hope International trying to, uh, trying to create schools for poverty stricken children uh, in their community. Um, they've also created secondary schools outside of Nairobi, uh, out in the country. And once kids have graduated from the elementary schools uh, around the valley, they're able to go to the secondary schools. And you have to test 
to go to the secondary schools. Not everybody gets to go. This interesting character is uh, named Stephen Mwangi. Stephen, we uh, started sponsoring him when he was six years old. He was in the first school group, in that first group of 50 people, 50 children. And he is now an, in university studying to be an attorney. Uh, we still help sponsor him uh, privately before we were sponsoring him through uh, the uh, Mission to Hope International. But he's, he's looking at a speaker who is talking about um, what kind of hope that people can have. These, these are only Africans, only Kenyans. I'm the only white guy in the, in the room. These are Kenyans who are talking about how can they improve their community? How can they interface with the government uh, and have a voice? It's just a, a quick shot of uh, Stephen's apartment. He now lives outside the Mathari Valley, going to university. And just all the colors that were going on, the reflections, the, the, the smoothness of the bowls. Uh, if you'll notice, do you notice one thing about this picture? There's only one spigot. That's cold water. There's no such thing as hot water. There's uh, uh, for people living in, in some of these situations. Again, just a simple shot. I enjoyed. Um, we actually had a meal with Stephen in his uh, apartment. His uh, older sister came and cooked for him and for us. One of the things that we've always done, and uh, we, we, it's been recommended to us and to everybody who goes on any kind of these mission trips. Give yourself about a three day holiday or a four day holiday at the end of the trip and do something spectacular, do something unusual. Um, this was in Ma the Maasai Mara. Uh, and I am about as close as you can imagine to these uh, cheetahs who are just waiting they're, they're focused on some wildebeest that are way over in the other direction. They're not going to catch them. Wildebeest are far enough away. But a mom and her and two looks like probably yearling cubs. Um, that uh, this was this was exciting. I have more shots of animals on the Maasai Mara, but I just wanted to show you this one as uh, a representation of. You know, it's, it's not just all about the, the work and the teaching, nor just about the photography. It's also about rewarding yourself when you do things like this and, and be able to help, um, help fire your enthusiasm to, you know, to do it again at some other place. Um, this was on our first trip to Kenya. Uh, this is on our second trip to Kenya. And we gave ourselves, uh, at the end of that 30 days, uh, we were asked where we should go. And everybody around us said, said uh, you need to go to Mombasa uh, over on the India Ocean. There's this place that's phenomenal. And as you can see, there's an infinity pool and you're looking at the India Ocean there. And here's the amazing part. It was $95 a night all inclusive, all the food you could eat, and all the drinks that you could drink, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic, for $95 a night. I said it would be worth going over there just for a two-week vacation, but the airfare would kill you. So that was just uh, my take on it. But uh, just beautiful scenery. Reward yourself for doing some of these. Thailand, Indonesia, and Myanmar. We've actually been to Thailand three times. Indonesia once, we were there for 21 days, and Myanmar, we were there for 30 days uh, on, with different organizations. Um, and so these images are represent, representing that, uh, that trip. We were there again uh, in Thailand for the first two trips we took, we were working with refugee camps uh, where the Myanmar dictatorship at the time 
uh, had kicked everybody out. If you were educated, if you wore glasses, if you could read, um, they were all kicked out and they went over to Thailand. Thailand uh, said, well, wait, whoa, 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 you know, and put them in uh, essentially camps where they weren't concentration camps. Uh, they were more like camps. They fenced them all in, told them they couldn't go. They could build huts out of whatever they wanted to. Uh, they could find food wherever they wanted to, but they, um, they couldn't continue over. So this, we landed in Bangkok and we were strolling around and they were showing us the city. And this was a street performer, as you can see. And you may notice that I desaturated all the background around him because the guy that's stooping down right here working on the piece, some mechanical piece of equipment, he had a bright green shirt on that was as green as this green right here on this, this guy's uh, um, costume. And I don't know if, he, if this guy put the sign up there that says no photo, but I thought, eh, He's busy singing and playing, and I'm in a crowd of, of students, and I'm a crowd of people watching him, and I just clicked away a couple of times. He, if you noticed, it's like his left eye is a little bit opened up. He's probably saying, I thought you could read English. You know, it said no photo, <laughs> but I don't know what he, what he did, uh, what he was thinking. He's probably happy. This was a, a little um, Myanmar girl uh, in the constant, or in the camps. The, uh, the I don't. I, they didn't give them a name. They just said concentration camps. But they they weren't the concentration camps that you think of that existed in Germany or something like that. They're they're much more friendly. Although I can tell you, the guards uh, were guarding all the entrances with AK-47s. Um, and I was not allowed to take in my big uh, Nikon camera. And at, at the time I had a little uh, G7 Canon point and shoot. And that's what I took the picture of this little girl with. And some people ask the question, is that decoration? Actually, it's both. It's decoration and it's a mosquito repellent. It's a wood that, that they uh, make a powder out of and it's supposed to be for their complexion, uh, mosquito repellent, and they make patterns out of them. And I don't think I have the image in here. I know I don't. Uh, there are some women who will actually use that com uh, combination in order to make themselves appear to be more white uh, because it's, it's more, in their minds, culturally acceptable. Uh, so again, we, we were there, we were helping uh, in a computer center and you're gonna see here in a minute uh, uh, what else we were doing. Uh, this was in, on our third trip to Thailand and one of the there was only six of us on this trip and one of the one of the guys was an electrician um, and worked with a large company uh, station in Denmark but he actually lived here in the United States and he was a global manager um, of electrical appliances and he had electrical background he's talking to these people in the hills of uh, Thailand outside of um, uh, May Sat, Thailand, which was right almost up on the border uh, between Myanmar uh, and, and Thailand. And we could actually walk to where the guards were uh, on the border. And I turned this into a black and white. I liked the reflection right in here, it, the, the refraction that, of, his, of his glasses, his interest. And he's looking at um, at the guy who was speaking and is intrigued. I don't know what his daughter is looking at, but she's looking over in a different direction. I have tons of uh, images of the people who were gathered to hear this lecture about electricity. Um, 
and something that, that they were really interested in, especially in the mountains of Myanmar. Um, in, if you can imagine with me for a moment, this area all over here is Myanmar. There's a river that runs between the border of Myanmar and Thailand. And the people who were able to escape down near a more populated area were given permission to build huts right down on the side of the river as long as they did not try to build and migrate into the city uh, of Mesat. Um, and again, we, we were working with school kids, we were working with the teachers, uh, we were doing health presentations, uh, we had two nurses with us, um, and again, we were doing the, the whole family systems therapy, trying to help people understand about, you know, how to, how to get along with each other um, and create friendships and create dialogue. Uh, looking at families of origin and how people create dynamic changes in their family, or they repeat the same kind of patterns which are in the family. Um, just a black and white image, and I, I love the fact that they had a Coca-Cola banner that they'd gotten from someplace to, to put around this uh, chat. And the clouds are real, and um, it, it poured. Uh, not shortly after taking this image. I think you all saw this one. I think I got an honorable mention out of this one, out of, um, uh, what's his name? When he was judging, um, Steve Sadler helped me, uh, who was the, the judge that lives in Habity Grace. I just know his name. Um, Anyway, we were treated to a, a concert. Les Picker? I'm sorry? Les Picker? Les Picker. Les Picker was judging for you guys, and, um, and I got an honorable mention for this uh, print. But anyway, I don't know if you've heard Asian music or heard a live presentation. You can go online and actually you know, download or listen to some live Asian music from Thailand and Myanmar. It is so unpleasant to my ears. It's so discordant. I mean, I like Beethoven and, and Mozart and, you know, and, and all of the, the great little melodies that, uh, that come out of symphonies and things. But this was just clang, clang, clang. And I have, I have several, uh, probably at least a hundred shots of different parts of this, uh, little band that got together and people were dancing and they were doing their their finger thing and uh, how they move their fingers backwards as part of their dance uh, it was just a, a lovely time um, we were in in the mountains uh, of Myanmar when uh, the Myanmar Thailand border what we were doing is not only talking about electricity but we also help them install a computer center uh, with the internet uh, that, and got all that set up. Uh, we bought them a couple of computers that they could put in their uh, nicer computers that they could put in their, uh, in their village and in the house that was being created for the, um, for the internet center. And what they hoped was people could cross across the border uh, back and forth and maybe connect, reconnect uh, with their families in Myanmar that they had fled. Um, so it's not just about teaching. I was, I was stringing uh, cable, uh, was one of my jobs uh, when I wasn't teaching. Now we're skipping over to Indonesia and this was just a little niche in a juice shop. Um, I love the colors. The colors are pretty accurate. I didn't have to do a lot of post-processing on this one. 
this image is actually sold several times. Uh, the people who uh, just wanted it for their dining room or maybe uh, a breakfast area. Uh, just a neat little shot of uh, handmade pottery and hand glazed pottery uh, in this little niche in a juice shop. Uh, on my 65th birthday is when we were there um, in Indonesia. And for my birthday, the lady that we were staying with, because uh, it was just my wife and I on this trip, uh, had a friend who was also a photographer. And he said, hey, Jerry, you want to go? There are plenty of extinct volcanoes around this part of Salatiga, Indonesia. Would you like to walk up to, the, to a volcano that I'm familiar with? And so we got up at four o'clock in the morning and, and trek, trekked, trekked up the, uh, uh, at 65 years old, trekked up the, the, the mountain, this extinct volcano. And we're greeted by, you know, just, this image, you know, the, the skies, uh, the fog that was coming in from the, the sea, uh, it was just managing and the, all the lights that you can see there, you see little specks of uh, reflection where well, these are houses way down on, on, uh, on the plateau. Um, and it was, and, and by the way, most of the time when I'm shooting with uh, the 750 or the 700 before that one, uh, I'm actually shooting manual. Uh, I'm doing all this, this stuff. I very rarely use program uh, mode because I want, and I'm looking for the art. I'm looking for the art. And this is the, the side benefit. This is one of the things. I mean, I, we were teaching, uh, and if I could, could show you, and I can show you, it's not part of the presentation. Uh, we were teaching what was referred to as an international uh, symposium on marriage and family. And we had college students, college professors. We had all kinds of people there. It was very humbling to be there. And we were the keynote speakers. Um, but this was our reward for being part of, uh, of that 21 day experience. Of course, we got out to uh, other parts of Indonesia and you can see these kind of scenes all over the place. I just like the, 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 uh, the horizontal lines and then you get the, the triangle of the little hut and the trees and the trees over here and you, you can go back and forth and may not be able to see, but there's a little dummy, a little uh, a, a scarecrow uh, sitting up here. And I, was, I, I asked, I said, what is this little uh, hut for? And they said, well, the hut is for the workers in the heat of the day. They take a siesta. Um, I, thought, I, thought, well, that, I thought that was Mexico. No, internationally, people take naps in the middle of the day uh, who are working in the field. Uh, sold this image a couple of times as, as well um, to people who have been to Indonesia and don't happen to have this particular shot. The Laughing Buddha uh, were over, you know, many different places um, in Indonesia. And we traveled over to Bali, which was the reward of our 21 days uh, going chose black and white for this because there were just a lot of browns and I think I thought the contrast were uh, was greater uh, in in the black and white and I think I use silver effects pro um, on this particular image if you've not worked with silver effects pro I would highly recommend it uh, you get a lot of different uh, feelings out of it the uh, we were we were headed to Bali. We we had to fly from where we were to Bali, and uh, from Salatiga to Bali, and we went on this trail. And they said, uh, 
well, we're going to take you on the monkey trail. And again, I got several shots of monkeys, but this, this little guy was the, just the, the shot of the day for me. He's eating on his banana peel. He had eaten the banana already. His eyes are just looking straight at me. I've got catch light in his eyes. And he's got a little mohawk. The, I think they call these macaque uh, monkeys. I'm not, I'm not up on, on my animal stuff. But he's, he's leaning on this trash barrel uh, and just looking at me like they weren't, they weren't afraid of people. Um, and I, I like the, the shallow depth of field that I was able to achieve on this. Uh, which is exactly what I wanted because I wanted his eyes to be as sharp uh, as you're as you know you know you're told if you you don't have the eyes sharp you know just forget it you might as well throw that one away so this one you've seen uh, I think I don't know if it got a first or a second in the print division not when we were still meeting together um, this was on the island of Bali. This was uh, that, that dance that they do, this traditional dance, the monkey gods, the good and evil. And this is, this is the, for the moment, he's the good guy, but he changes uh, his presentation. I'm shooting all of this um, with a 750 and I'm using a 70 to 200 lens. And I'm using uh, some, most of the time I'm at, at 2.8 um, at, at a distance and I think I got maybe to four a couple of times uh, because it was a really dark place and I of course I increased my ISO up to about 3200 um, and I didn't didn't catch a lot of noise I was really happy and of course there was a lot of post-processing of this background stuff because um, I wanted to, again, this this man to stand out, this actor to stand out, this dancer to stand out. I think the most work I did was on this little pinwheel over here to, to kind, kind of diminish it and uh, get it. Another little story. Um, again, we're we're back in Indonesia, and and. Uh, visiting some homes of uh, people and this particular home is a home for uh, women girls who have been rescued from prostitution from uh, slavery um, and this little has the little infant here is actually uh, a pregnancy that happened while this uh, Another woman, not this woman here, uh, was uh, impregnated through, you know, her slavery. But one of the things I wanted to say about this image is kids are great mimics. And I was, with one hand, I was waving. I was waving to this little kid. And I kept waiting and waiting. And she finally put her hand up. And I'm got, I've got the camera in the other hand. <laughs> And I'm not, I'm not on a tripod and I'm just doing steady as I can go. And uh, I catch this image of her in this uh, hammock. This is actually in Myanmar now. Uh, the Swodogan Pagoda, um, um, a religious center for them. We're at nighttime. Again, I'm not on a tripod i i just don't want to tr carry a tripod every to all these places it's a, it's a problem on the plane it's a problem in a cab it's a problem in, in storing and carrying it and everything else and so i'm hand holding all this stuff and just the i what i love about this image is you see the three taxis which are going on uh, coming into the image or coming my direction um, the blue lights and the golden lights that are reflecting off the gold leaf uh, of all the pagodas that as a, a worship center for the people in Myanmar um, my time between 
to Thailand and Myanmar, we're talking about a five-year difference where uh, the borders of Myanmar begin to open up. Uh, we were confined um, to Yangon. We were not allowed to go anyplace else uh, because there was outside of Yangon on travel, if you were, could, were traveling by road. Uh, there were thieves that were stopping, stealing, wanting money, uh, even kidnapping people. Uh, so we, uh, we stayed in Yangon for the 30 days. Now here's this just kind of a little fun image. Uh, this is the size of the people. They're just small people. I'm six, about 6'2", six a little shorter than 6'2", anymore. But these, these young women are learning English as a second language, and they're all learning to be um, uh, nurse assistants. They're going to be uh, what we would call a practical nurse uh, here in the United States. Uh, and we took over their English class for three weeks, and we had five of us who were helping with English, and then on another group of adults, uh, older than these, and teachers and leaders, uh, my wife and I actually had afternoon sessions uh, for marriage and family therapy teaching. Uh, but this, this was so much fun, uh, working with these young, young girls, young ladies. Uh, they were, they, they giggled, they had fun. We had fun with them. On, on a street corner, <clears throat> tiger shrimp. And I think I was told that these were squid, but if you look over here, there's a fly here, there's a fly here, and there's a fly over here. And uh, one of the guys with me said, so you wanna buy some shrimp? I said, no, thank you. I was not ready for shrimp. But it's like every place in, in a, in a foreign country, you know, becomes an opportunity for an artistic uh, expression. Uh, and uh, someone said when I did the show uh, at Lyria Dendron that uh, they were surprised at the diversity of the, of, of the show, uh, how, how many different uh, things I had taken. And I always call myself an eclectic uh, camera guy. I'm not much of, uh, you know, just I'm not a one image guy or one theme or anything else. Um, this was on a banana plantation in, in Myanmar. Um, I, I just thought it was whimsical, you know, the, uh, the two big eyes. And uh, there was a, this is one of those carts or tractors. It's a two wheel tractor uh, that you uh, stand on a little skid and then connected to the, the back of that uh, uh, tractor is a wagon where they're putting in bunches of bananas. Um, I just thought it was uh, cute. I love this one. It was, but we, were, uh, we were on our last couple of days there. And what, what was funny about this image, you, you, just the background, is these three kids saw me with my camera and said, take my picture, picture, picture. And I saw these two guys standing over around the corner of this blue building. And I, I did, I took pictures of these guys. And then I told the other ones, I said, come on, you, you need to get in this too. I wish I could go back and find these kids and give them each a copy of this picture. Uh, I just love it. Their smiles, their victory sign. I don't know what the four was. I know what the thumbs up is, you know, but you, it's like, and the thing I was amazed by probably because it was more not actually known uh, is that I got all of their eyes, nothing, no hands are in front of their eyes. 
but I took several, several shots of them. This is my favorite. I'd love to be able to go back. And uh, these are the things, these are the side things, the side benefits of being able to, to take trips like this. And someone asked a question uh, a while back when I presented this to another club in, in person. Uh, they said, well, how do you pay for this? I said, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, and then fortunately because we, are, we have the resources to be able to do it, we pay our own way on these trips. And because we were in private practice, when we left, there was nobody bringing in money. That, uh, so we got a double whammy. It cost us to be out, and plus it cost us uh, not to be working. However, in this particular Myanmar trip, uh, we had five additional therapists in our office by this trip. Uh, but when we began, we would just take the trips and, and foot the bill ourselves. It was fun. Um, I'm looking, it's almost nine o'clock and I, I gotta hurry along here. This was in Myanmar as well. I'm sitting, sitting in a taxi cab, my, my, my camera is hanging out the window and I got my, um, what do you call that moment? Decisive moment. If you notice, foot off the ground, foot off the ground. And then again, I desaturated because I, I wanted the monks to be uh, the primary image. And again, this one uh, has been sold a couple of times uh, simply because people uh, like the image or they have a Buddhist background uh, that they, it's part of their faith system. This one is um, <clears throat> five generals who, when the dictatorship took over, these five generals, and yes, there was a woman general, these five generals were imprisoned until the dictatorship collapsed. And this is a celebration, Independence Day, that we were invited to. And we got to, I actually have uh, one of these pins that was given to me by one of these guys. Um, and I have it on a, on a shirt that I bought in, Indonesia, in Myanmar. Uh, great story for those guys. Europe, Israel, Iceland, Greenland, or England, Scotland, and Romania. Um, only took a couple of images. Uh, I've only included a couple of images here. Our primary purpose was, was not to teach, even though we were teaching uh, within the group. There was a group of 46 people from Milligan University, formerly Milligan College. Um, and we were teaching, uh, again, family systems to the people that were uh, on that trip. Um, this is down at the Wailing Wall. Uh, I'm using the P1000, which has a focal distance of 24 to 3000. And I was all the way out at 3000 uh, to get this image. And the P1000 actually has captures in raw. So I was able to do a little work. Again, I, get, I caught the catch light in his eyes. Uh, he's, he's got that furrowed brow because you're not supposed to be taking pictures of them. However, it's interesting that when you get to the Wailing Wall, if you've ever been to the Wailing Wall, there's lots of uh, people of Jewish faith are, who are down in the Wailing Wall, at the Wailing Wall, and they're taking pictures of everything. But since you're not Jewish and not ex uh, addressed in the form of Judaism that they practice there, uh, they don't want their picture taken. This is, this is hanging on my dining room wall. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, obviously a tree that's, that's much newer. Um, and I, I colorized it a little bit differently, made it more painterly, if, if you will. It's hanging on my dining room wall. Uh, and I had a, a, a big print made uh, for my dining room wall. 
Garden of Gethsemane. If you've been to Iceland, you know you recognize this uh, this place. This is the uh, at the airport that you fly into to get to Reykjavik, uh, and this is a huge statue that is about flight. And I like the close-up. I liked all of the glass. It was almost like a mosaic to me uh, to be able to see it in this image. Uh, again, one of the benefits, and then this was a layover uh, image. Uh, people go to Iceland and take all kinds of waterfall shots, and I have some. Uh, but for this one, for this presentation, I included this because this is the mist that's hovering and falling off the glacier that is back in this area. This is just the mist. Oops. Let's see if I can get it back. I can get it back. Uh, this is the mist that's falling off. Uh, that clouds and the colors and everything else. Um, the next one, uh, if, any, if any of you have been to Iceland, you, you know about the lake that you can go swimming in and it's warm. It's like bathtub warm. And I was walking around and found this little spot where the slip of land on the other side and the reflections that were happening in the sky and the sea. Uh, and if you've been to Iceland, uh, this was the place where somebody had put the cast iron skillet into the ground uh, about uh, two feet down and they had baked bread for us for fresh uh, for this little gathering. And again, it was just my wife and I on this. The, uh, this was in Scotland. Um, this was part of a cathedral and this is the choir room in the cathedral. Uh, just looking up, capturing all the windows. Uh, I was using the 24 to 70 um, and plenty of light. So I was probably shooting at uh, 18, uh, probably uh, not, I wasn't at 22 or anything like that. Um, and I was not laying on the ground, but I was virtually laying on the ground. Scotland again, this was uh, uh, through, I've actually sold this one to a brewery here to, in, in Hartford County. Uh, it's hanging on their brewery wall. Uh, this is a Scotch bat uh, in a historic plant that's now closed down. And this is where the, the Scotch would all be blending, all the seed, all the corn, whatever goes into the component of, uh, of Scotch. Um, just an interesting shot. Um, if you're uh, familiar with Castle May, uh, which is up in Scotland where the Queen Mother used to live, uh, this was an outbuilding we were going through. Um, and I just saw the two rocks sitting there. And somebody, a judge who look, was looking at this one time said, why the two lines? This is, this is crazy. Why do you have those two lines? Well, they were laundry lines. Uh, this was part of the laundry room uh, outside, and this was the, the laundry court where they would actually hang laundry. But I simply like the composition because those two rocks were just sitting there in this window, and I liked the, the feel of it, the, the, the uh, reflection of the green, the grass up here. Um, it was just fun. Out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and we rented a car and we drove our 30 days in Scotland um, and it was drizzling a little bit. And my wife said, I don't want to get out of the car. And I said, OK, I'm going to. And you couldn't drive up to this building. You had to walk to it. And lo and behold, when I rounded the corner, this is what I found. Graffiti in this building was spectacular. I've, I've taken several. I took several image images of the graffiti in this uh, image. Roof is gone, but the, the walls inside have some fantastic graffiti. We went to the Orkney Islands, uh, took a boat over to the Orkney Islands, and pretty much, um, you know, 
England and Scotland went through their Catholic revolution where they were destroying all kinds of uh, cathedrals and, uh, and places. The Scots not so much as the English did, but uh, this is a uh, cathedral on the uh, main island, Orkney Island. Uh, I just like the symmetry, uh, the, the depth of field, the feeling of an altar with uh, vegetation of some kind, flowers that were there. Uh, just an interesting, again, shot for me, from my perspective. Now we're in Romania, and if you, uh, if you say what other people have said about this, it says, look like uh, you were cloning um, uh, Dorothea Lange when you took this image. This is actually a gypsy uh, aroma. They don't necessarily like calling being called gypsy. We were working with Remember the Children in Romania. And one of the things that they do is they go out to the city dump in, uh, in Oradia, where a group of gypsies live. And this is a family. Uh, this is the mother of family. She has seven kids. Um, and she struck that pose herself. I didn't pose her. I'm, I'm using my 70 to 200 uh, on a 750. Uh, and just, I, I loved, I just loved her face, the simple simplicity of her face. Uh, Romania as well. We were teaching in uh, a different part of Romania. We, we actually, in our, our 30 days in Romania, we traveled almost to every city that you could imagine in Romania. Uh, and we started out, we were only supposed to do five little marriage conferences with people. We wound up doing nine because people uh, got word that there were these two funny Americans who were... Uh, we were talking, they've been married for years and years, and they're talking about marriage and family and children and all this other stuff. And this little couple, he's, he's about five foot tall. She may be five foot one. And he had a sparkle in his eye. And she was not, she wasn't interested in her picture being taken. But this was the first time we were there. Second time we were there, she came up and hugged me and she we, she's she's in love with us now um, they have 12 children they've been married for 56 years um, great great couple just uh, again you can see the sparkle in his face and uh, interest these are some of the orphans, gypsy orphans and orphans and Romanian orphans. Uh, reminds me of a Norman Rockwell uh, print when it talks about children uh, of all different kinds. Um, most of these are, are living in, in shacks and empty. Um, empty, when I say empty, there's no furniture, they're sleeping on the f dirt floor. Um, and remember the children is creating houses, building houses, and, and putting families in houses. It's not just about, you know, giving them food. It's also about giving them a living, giving them an opportunity to do something different. Um, this one struck me, and I put it in here because uh, every, every once in a while, I'll look for graffiti that may maybe make some sense of what's going on. And this struck me, forever alone. I don't know what all the rest of the other stuff was saying. It was in a foreign language to me. But somebody in English scribbled forever alone. This one's sold a couple of times as well, uh, which is an unusual image. One of the things that happened um, in Romania uh, was the final solution, as the Germans uh, referred to it at the time. And this is a synagogue that still is um, vacant, abandoned. Um, 
I got to walk down the street that was known as the Jewish corner, cor corridor in Oradia, Romania. And again, I have a lot of, a lot of photos. But um, this is where we're told by one of the people with us that uh, Jewish individuals were dragged out into the street and just shot. People would go to this synagogue to rescue and shelter, and they finally just broke into the place and killed people. You know, just sad story. This is interesting. Uh, we went to a retreat place where we were going to, again, teaching leaders. And this was known as a retreat for the regime that was the communist regime that was running Romania uh, during the last uh, should, should have written a note on this one. Um, anyway, just to show you, this, this stuff still remains there. And it was where the leaders, the Romanian leaders uh, of the Communist Party would go and retreat. This image, Carpathian Mountains. It was a hoar frost day, everything frosted over. And there is a cabin right here, just to give you the dimension of all of this. In every place we traveled that day, everything was covered in the hoarfrost. It was 27 below zero and fog that, however hoarfrost forms, was uh, formed on everything. And this uh, was we were going to a Holocaust museum in, in Romania, and this is a sunrise looking west. This was a one-shot deal. I was going across a wooden bridge, and I was lagging behind, as photographers do, you know, and you want to take shots, want to take shots. And, um, and they were telling me, hurry up, hurry up. And I saw this image, and this was one shot. This one eventually will go on a print on a wall because I, uh, I just, I just love the softness of it. The reflection here and here, uh, the reflection here in the sky up here. Gary? Yes. Oh, oh good. It's a perfect time to just stop for a minute. Yep. Um, I have a question for Kent, from Kent who wanted to talk about the image, uh, that image of the washing room and the clothesline through the window. Yes. Right? And his question is about post-processing there. And then I was wondering about post-processing for the one you just showed. So could you just speak about, you know? Yeah, the post-processing uh, and that I did in the uh, Romania shot when we were going to the Holocaust Museum, um, that looking, uh, looking west at a, at a, at a sunrise, uh, pretty much I, I don't, I did increase the saturation a bit, but I didn't do a lot to it because it was, it was just incredible sight. I mean, the, uh, uh, that was, that was pretty much there. Uh, I, I think I vignetted it a little bit uh, around the edges, uh, hopefully not too much, but uh, so you could concentrate on those reflections. As, as far as the, the window was concerned, what was the question there? Again, post-processing. Just curious post about the post-processing. Post-processing again in, in Lightroom. Um, the windows is what he mentioned. And can't speak up if you, you know, if you want. I just thought it, you know, there was kind of an artistic touch to that picture. And I was wondering if you had done anything to it. Yeah, I, uh, again, I, one of the things that, um, you know, I, I rarely have a capture out of a camera that I haven't messed with. And probably 
if if I were to show you my process, because um, I I know I watched you guys last uh, last month or last week, uh, how you were doing processing, and I I do a lot of that stuff, but I do something that's a little bit more with brushes, uh, because one of the mentors that I've had over the years, um, who was a graphic artist. He says, Jerry, you need to think like a painter. You need to use that brush more intentionally. And I do use that brush. Uh, and I, I will create uh, either sharpness or out of focus on small, por small portions or large portions of images simply by using the brushes and um, that they're available in Lightroom. But like I said, I very rarely, almost never use. Okay. Um, Good. Thank you. Okay. So I think we're heading down the, uh, no, let me go through these, these quickly. Canadian uh, maritime provinces, a church that was for sale. Um, did a little post-processing on that one to eliminate some electric lines. Um, all the grass had grown up. It hadn't sold. There was still a for sale sign that's over here on the right-hand side uh, that I also have a picture of. But Because um, I, I want to get down to the... Um, anybody know who this is? Unless you're a country western fan. I was asked to, uh, I, let me go back. I was, I was the only um, photographer allowed on stage and this was at Habit of Grace. Um, and again, I'm having that senior moment. Um, he's a blind West, uh, country Western singer. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. I was asked to uh, do uh, a rehearsal uh, for the Sleeping Beauty. Um, and this was a shot, reminded me of a Degas um, image painting. This one you've seen, uh, it won a prize for a print. Again, taken with a P1000, um, the Nikon Cool Picks. Because uh, I, I was far enough away that I, I needed to get that extra zoom. Uh, I know people poo-poo the idea of that camera. Uh, it has worked fabulously for me. Um, and I've, I've had fun with it, some great images out of it. Um, Tombstone, Arizona, street guy. I was sitting in the back of my son and uh, son and daughter-in-law's car, and we were going over all these hilly roads. And I thought, I'm just going to get out my camera and shoot, see see what it come up with. And I like the sort of abstract quality of these rolling hills that were going over, and the lines in the road, and tapering off over into the right-hand side. Um, these yeah. are. Jerry, I'm so sorry. I have the answer to the quiz of the country singer, Ronnie Millsap. Ronnie, Ronnie Millsap. Very good. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, <good>. guy. <laughs> yeah. Now, I concluded this one because I, I, I want you to, to be able to look at uh, the building and I want you to look at the sky. These are silver sided, you know, uh, steel. Uh, granaries abandoned, of course, and the reflection of the sky, that blue is what the sky looked like. But if I had left the sky blue, it would have not done anything. So I popped out the image by in deep saturating the sky behind it. The clouds were right there. They, I was fortunate. Uh, those wispy clouds were right there just to accentuate it. Um, it was just a lucky thing, but a choice about the desaturation. Arizona again, late afternoon, um, on our 34 days across America. 
uh, capture the, the, the lines uh, on the electric lines, power, high tension power lines. Um, this one was in white, or not white sands, in, uh, in the uh, Great Sand Dunes National Park. Uh, and the thing I want you to see is this shadow right here. And I want you to think of a Na Native American woman who's got her head back looking up at the sky. Her hair is flowing in the background and her, her robe is flowing and a little profile of her face and the bump of her chest as she's looking up to her ancestors or something. I didn't see this until I got home. It was just a picture of sand dunes as far as I was concerned, but uh, I popped out at me and um, I love it. It's hanging on my wall. Sometimes there's just not enough stones from Forrest Gump. This is what we slept on in the Apache Indian Reservation sleeping bag and a little mattress and camera bags and a bag and shoes. This was taken at the Apache Indian Reservation and as traditionally and, and maybe un, uh, unflattering as you can be, these are just glass block windows in a, um, in a recreation center and I'm taking this from the inside of the building, shooting out. All of the, uh, we were told by the Indian uh, representative who was with us, is there, there are lights on the outside of this building and there's a group of Indians who like their alcohol. They come out at night under these lights, and when they finish drinking their bottles, they throw them at the windows. Make a great abstract. One of the team members says, if you show this to my husband, I'm gonna shoot you. Petrified forest, close up, macro shot. Puerto Rico, oversaturated a bit, but I just want you to see that the texture of this little girl. This was after the hurricane, she's lost her home uh, and we're there to, to help. We're doing medical stuff. Another simple abstract. This one, it's a woman sitting in a chair. This is the white chair. She's got red pants on and a black top. A woman who was 97 years old, she said, I've lived through lots of hurricanes. This one was pretty bad. Again, looking at the eyes. I want to get to this final one. 82 year old grandfather. He's the father of this guy right here. 17 children, many wives. His youngest child is seven years old. So just think about subtract seven. The son is father, community leader, one wife, four children. Just three generations ago, the men in this family were headhunters of their enemies. It's the mother and the daughter and two of his sons. His oldest son was 23. He was murdered along with his cousin who was 20. Murdered by two Americans who had come into this remote village and were looking to steal things. And these two young men happened upon them. And rather than run away, the Americans didn't run away. They decided they would kill these two guys and still move on. Beautiful country, beautiful town, 
Even the leaves are beautiful. A young boy who needs an operation. Every time I tried to take his picture, he would hide his face because he knows he's cross-eyed. You all saw this one, another award winner. The children with, with uh, Compassion International get one big meal a week. And that's what we were there helping, meal preparation, teaching, and feeding the children. So that's the end. And I'm, I'm looking at the time. It's 9.29, 9.30. Uh, our last trip was to Tanzania. I have no images because my camera and laptop were stolen on my last day in country from our locked hotel room. Because I would have loved to have shown you some of the images I had from Tanzania. That's it. I'm, t I'm talking and you guys can't hear me. Thank you. Very Thank good, you very Jerry. Much. Um, are there any questions? Take a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Uh, Jerry. Yes. Uh, what part of Indonesia were you in? Were you at? We were in Salatiga, uh, which is up from Jakarta. Uh, it would be, let's see, it would be south because uh, Jakarta is where we flew into and then you know, we flew south to, or um, we just traveled by bus. It was like, uh, ac actually somebody picked us up. Uh, it was two and a half hours south of uh, Jakarta. Do you know if that's close to Aceh? I don't. Yeah, I was in, I was doing some um, missionary work in um, Aceh in Indonesia in 2005. When the tsunami hit, so we sent we sent a team over there to uh, build two schools in an agriculture center. We had a team of seventeen. Yeah. So I do a lot of missionary work with through my church also, yeah. and I'm also convoy of hope. Yep, great. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I, it's it's not mine to challenge. I, again, I'm I'm humbled that that you all sat through all of this, and mm. uh, and and I really. Um, Humble that I looked at, you know, you had speakers before me and speakers after me, and there were people I like, and I'm thinking, holy cow, I'm in the middle of <laughs> these really popular people. But, uh, Jerry, this is Diane. I have, I have a question, and yes. you're part of PSA as well, so um, they, they probably have regulations about this, but photos of people from other countries to sell images or to do competitions, do you need to get release forms for those? What, um, what, what, what are things now? I mean, the story has been changing even in the last couple of years with PSA. Yeah, it has. And um, it, it's like, when, when you have captured them, you know, with their permission and on the street, uh, you're not, you know, you're not posing, you're doing things. Uh, and most of the time I get permission. You know, I'd say 20% of the time I don't get permission, but 80% of the time I probably get permission from people. Um, I don't have releases to, to, for people to sign. Um, and actually those kind of images, I, I don't sell. I, I'm not gonna sell any of those images of people. Because I'm I'm weary of, of, of the same thing. I don't want to impose on somebody's uh, privacy or uh, in in that regard. You know, it's fine for my own personal use and um, and so maybe a couple of friends to, who has been have been in the trips, some of the trips, and they'll say, "Hey, can I have a copy of that?" Yeah. Yeah, I know. I just experience I've had. Um leading an uh, inter-club competition or part of the you know group of us was with the 3d competition but yeah just in the last year or two if your image wins if you submit to PSA if you don't have a release 
you don't win. They take your image out and give it to the next person. So I just wanted people to be aware of that. So um, yeah, you can enjoy your images, but um, but yeah, if there's any people in them, I know a PSA now, you have to have a release for everything. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong on all of the divisions, maybe it's just the 3D division I was in. Yeah, I, I, I'm really not conversant with that. Mm. Part of that judging. Um, <clears throat> So I, I, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. You know, just, just be safe. Just be safe and, well, respect, you know, and respectful. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, um, there's been a lot of videos on street photography. And as long as it's on the street, in, in many countries, you don't need a model release. That's right. To consider to be public property, you know, right. like public property. Right. This is what the paparazzi do all the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you, you know, it's, it shouldn't be a problem. Maybe what it is is that particular organization, they may want a model release, but as street photography is concerned, you don't need a model release. Yeah, yeah. But even in Mathari Valley, when I'm, I was going with uh, one other person, a uh, native in the valley, um, who also has the last name of Taylor, which is interesting. <laughs> but um, uh, he, he took me through the valley and, and he, he would translate and you say, you know, can can he take the picture? Uh, and some, most of the time, I'd say 80% of the time, 75% of the time, people would shake their head yes, and they were happy uh, to do it. But uh, other, other times they would say, no, 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 please don't. Yeah, well, be beautiful photos. You just have a knack for capturing the essence of someone's soul, essentially. So that's that's great. Wonderful. Gary? Yeah. I wanted to ask you about your cool pics P1000. Yes. How long, how long have you been using it? And um, do you know if, if it's still available? Yes, matter of fact, um, the P1000, if I would have my choice, like there's the P900 and they recently just came out with the P950 and the P950, the well, let me go back. The drawback with the P900 was it would not shoot raw. It would not capture raw. But the P950 captures raw. It goes 24 to 2000. And the P1000 captures raw, but it goes 24 to 3000. And so really the, the handicap of that 3000 is trying to hand hold that thing. I mean, it has, it has a wonderful, I mean, you can feel it, the lens, you know, vibrating and stabilizing in your hand on that camera. Uh, but if right now, and again, uh, even the, the brand new P950 uh, is less than $1,000. So would you get the 950 or? I, I, would, I, would, I would go, I would get the 950. Okay. But I have that, another question. Go ahead. That's a choice. I, I just say that's a choice. If you want that extra thousand reach, go for the P P one thousand. Okay. And my second question is, um, did you happen to visit the Kabira slum in Kenya? Yes. And we drove onto it. And the interesting mm -hmm. thing, the organizations within Kabira. Um, the Marion and Wallace Kamau wanted, with Missions of Hope International, wanted to go over and help them create some schools. Kibera is, is like the Wild West compared to Mathari Valley. And uh, they did not want the school or any other stuff coming in because it would disrupt the gangs and the other yeah, stuff that's, right. that's, that's, right. going, that's going on in Cabrera. So. Uh, the gangs are, are ever prominent. They, they carry their water. Each gang has a different colored tube that carries their water. And so when one gang is angry at another gang, they go find the, the tube and they slice it. So all that water, which, which is non-existent, really, I mean, yeah. it's open, yeah. Yeah. is gone. It's bizarre. 
Okay, yes. so you did go to compare. Yes. Yeah, but I, 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 I was told do not take pictures in Cabrera slum. <laughs> well, I did take pictures. I didn't get permission, but honestly, <laughs> I was so, I was so, I don't know if horrified was the word. Yeah. Yeah. Shocked, sickened, all of it. Yeah. That I couldn't take a picture. It was. Yeah. The comparison, too, too the, the comparison between the comparison between the two is Mathari Valley gives you an idea of what um, you know good people who are trying to educate and bring people up uh, are uh, are able to accomplish. Where Cabrera slum, the gangs are controlling everything, and they want to they just want control. That's all. Right. I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Okay. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, this is Kay Ibrahim. Uh, Jerry, I, th I found your entire talk absolutely wonderful. And of course, I especially like the Kenya part. Um, we lived in Kenya for 13 years, but oh. I've never ever been to the area that you covered in your photographs. Uh, but I just think that your your photography is fantastic, and you definitely belong between those uh, those other speakers. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kay. That was nice. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's call it an evening. I want to thank you, Jerry. I, I it was education for me. It was inspirational. I love, you know, seeing you were generous with your images, loved your images. Most of all, I love the stories you were telling. Yeah. It the, the images to life for me. So mm -hmm. it was a treat. Thank you. Oh, excellent job. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. See you Thank next you. week. Thank okay. you. Everybody have a nice holiday. Be yes. safe yes. over the holiday, yes. people. Happy, 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 Happy Fourth of July. Okay. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, good night all. Good night, Larry. Good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end it now, you guys. <laughs> I just don't want to hang up on you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's so nice to see people. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Bye, Doug. Bye, Sandra. Bye, Bye Errol. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.